Friends in Christ, today the church throughout the world celebrates Divine Mercy Sunday. Divine Mercy Sunday is associated with two somewhat contemporary saints. First, a cloistered Polish nun, 20th century cloistered Polish nun, Saint Faustina, and secondly, somebody who is much more contemporary, that being Pope St. John Paul II, the one who instituted Divine Mercy Sunday. And we remember the blessing that Pope St. John Paul II received. Fifteen years ago, he passed away. He went to the Father's house. He passed away on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. What a great and a beautiful gift that was that our Lord gave to him. And so here it is that we celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. And I believe this is the 20th anniversary of the celebration of this, this particular Sunday in the life of the church. The first reading today, we hear from the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to hear from the Acts of the Apostles throughout the Easter season. And the reason for that is we're able to see the early church and what the early church did following the resurrection and following the ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the spirit that would teach them all things, the spirit that would animate them and move them forward to be able to fulfill the commandment that Jesus Christ had given, and that is to make disciples of all nations through baptism, through teaching, and reminding the world that Christ is always with us. So we hear in the very first reading how they devoted themselves to prayer, communal prayer, and they devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. Now when we speak about the breaking of the bread, we, ha we know that we have to go back to some other scriptural passages to fully understand what the Acts of the Apostles, what the early church was doing. We know that in John's Gospel, ch Gospel chapter 6, Jesus would say that my food is true drink, my blood, uh, my food is true, uh, true, my body is true food, my blood is true drink. So he was pointing to something that would come much later. And what would come much later would be the institution of the Eucharist, institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, in which Jesus gives the command, the commandment, to do this in memory of him. He doesn't simply say, do this in memory of me just on this night, or just until I ascend to the right hand of the Father, or just until the Holy Spirit is poured out, or just until all of you are alive. He gives the commandment for them to do this. And so we see with the early church, they devoted themselves to prayer and to the breaking of the bread. In other words, they were fulfilling that commandment of Jesus. And we know that in that breaking of the bread, they came to know Jesus, who was truly present to them, body, blood, soul, and divinity. The very same Jesus that comes to us today in the celebration of the sacrifice of the Mass here on Divine Mercy Sunday. And so we get a glimpse of the early church, and the work of the early church, and how they were faithful to the Lord and his commandments, and how we continue to that, do that up until this very day. So we are privileged to get that glimpse in the Acts of the Apostles. In the second reading from St. Peter, the reading reminds us of the great mercy of God and how in God's mercy we come to experience new hope in a new birth. And the new birth that we all come to experience is a new birth of Jesus Christ. If we have been buried with Christ, and we will also live with Christ. If Jesus has suffered and died, and he has risen, so too we also suffer and we die with Jesus, so that Christ might live more fully in us. That was the central message of sharing this good news with the early church. But let the church know that we were all sinners, and we are all in need of a Savior. And Coming to experience the Savior, we come to experience the mercy of God. 
God who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever might believe in him might not perish but might have eternal life. And so we who come to encounter the living Christ, we are buried with him so that we might always also rise. So we share in him with his paschal mystery. Every year on this Sunday, we hear the very same reading, the very same gospel. And as we look at this reading at the very beginning, it talks about how the apostles were gathered together in the upper room. Now, we know that the apostles minus one were gathered in the upper room, that being St. Thomas. And when our Lord appears to them, he dispels the fear that they were experiencing prior to his appearance. And we know that because scripture says that perfect love drives out fear. Jesus is perfect love incarnate. And so Jesus' presence drives out the fear, the fear that they were experiencing because they saw our Lord suffer and die. And now they come to know him in his resurrection. They come to understand the resurrection to which Jesus spoke to them about time and time again. But as we know, when he spoke to them about the resurrection, they did not quite fully understand when he said, I must suffer, I must die, and rise on the third day. But here they encounter the living Christ, and so you almost imagine the scales falling from their eyes and gaining this understanding of this is precisely what Jesus was speaking about when he spoke to us about the resurrection. As Jesus appears to them, the scriptures say he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Those you held bound are held bound. Now the church will teach us that this was the institution of the sacrament of penance, sacrament of reconciliation. We might more commonly call it confession. The church will say that in this gospel passage, that this is where we come to know the sacrament of reconciliation. John's gospel, chapter 20. This is a very important uh, memorization verse for all Catholics. I think we have a few of them that we want to make sure that we come to know and we can pull them out whenever we need them, whenever we're defending the faith, whenever we enter into apologetics. I think there are some very important scripture passages. Scripture passages such as John Gospel chapter 6, which I've already quoted. That is where Jesus tells us, my body's true food, my blood is true drink. And that's where also many people have a hard time with that saying. And as they go away, Jesus doesn't stop them and say, no, 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 come on back. I was just speaking symbolically. But we know that Jesus had the words of spirit and life, that his words that he always spoke were words that were true. And so in John chapter 6, what Jesus is doing is he's speaking words of truth. And he's preparing them for the institution of the Eucharist so that they might do this in memory of him. They might perpetuate the celebration of the Eucharist. And we know that in the Acts of the Apostles because they devoted themselves to prayer and the breaking of the bread. John chapter 6 is something that every Catholic should know. Another scripture passage that we should know very, very well is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. One of the reasons for this is we want to be able to teach somebody using scripture when we are questioned about different aspects of our faith. One of the aspects of our faith is the founding of the papacy, which continues up until today with our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and we refer to him as the successor of St. Peter goes all the way back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. And Jesus gives something to Peter that he does not give to the other apostles. And what he does is he gives them the keys of the kingdom, he gives them that authority, that authority to be the leader amongst the apostles to be that authority, to be Christ's leader of his church on earth. In other words, to be the vicar of Christ. 
And a vicar is somebody who acts or stands in the person of, and so the vicar of Christ acts or stands in the person of Jesus Christ. John 6 for the Eucharist, Matthew 16 for the, for the papacy, and then the scripture passage that we hear today, John's Gospel, chapter 20, for the sacrament of reconciliation, penance, or confession. Jesus says to them, those sins you forgive are forgiven. Those sins you held bound are held bound. Now, many times Catholics can say, why, people might say to us, why is it that you have to go to a priest? We all do. Why is it that you have to go to a priest and confess your sins in order to receive absolution? And the answer would be, we go back to our Lord's words. Remember, the words that our Lord spoke were words that were always true. He never said, well, I didn't really mean to say that. Wait, let me take that back. We can do that because we're fallible. We do things like that all the time. We might say something, well, I didn't say that exactly how I, I wanted to say it. Or, you know, maybe I want to re-say that again. Or maybe I said something was hurtful or harmful. I'd like to take it back. Jesus never did that. His words were always true. And so when Jesus says that, those sins you forgive are forgiven. Those you held bound are held bound. He meant that. And he gave that gift to the early church, that gift that continues up until today. So we have to think about it. Why is it that we have to go to a priest and confess our sins? And the answer is in those words of our Lord. If the priest, the apostles, let's start with the early church, if they were going to forgive or held bound, it meant that they needed to hear what it was that they are either forgiving or holding bound. Now, if somebody were to come to them and say, I've committed this sin, this sin, this sin, I'm truly sorry. I'm going to try with the help of God's grace not to commit that sin again. Obviously, the answer would be, those sins would be forgiven. And that power has been given to them by Jesus Christ himself. However, if somebody were to come to them and say, I've done this then, and this sin, this then. I'm sorry, but you know what? I'm going to continue doing those things again. Then the apostles at the time and the priests at this time would look and say, you're not truly contrite, and I can't forgive you those sins. In other words, I need to hold those sins bound. And hopefully what that will do is that will move the penitent to have a change of heart. Think about, you know, I do I truly want to live for myself and live for sin? Or do I truly want to live for Jesus and the life of grace? And so this is where we go back to the sacrament of penance, reconciliation, confession. John 20, John 6, Eucharist, Matthew 16, the papacy. And to this, we go to confession. And what a perfect day that we're able to hear this gospel passage. Because the sacrament of reconciliation or penance was referred to as by Pope St. John Paul II as a sacrament of mercy. Because in the sacrament of penance, we go with our sins, we go truly contrite, we confess our sins, we beg for God's mercy, and we receive God's mercy in this sacrament, the sacrament of mercy. And what better day to speak about the sacrament of mercy than speaking about it today on this Divine Mercy Sunday. So as I said, Thomas the Apostle was not there for the first time. They shared the story with him and he was unbelieving. Understandably so, he was unbelieving because he saw our Lord suffer and die. He had not encountered the risen Christ yet. And so you might imagine that he was still experiencing a great amount of grief over the death of our Lord. And if we think about it in ourselves, maybe sometime we've had a family member die, we've had a friend die, someone who's close to us, and we look back on that time and we would say, you know, it just seemed like a blur. You know, I really wasn't myself. And maybe St. Thomas the Apostle could have said that when that news was shared with him. And he says that I need to put my hands in his side, right? I need to put my hands in the nail marks need to touch in order to believe. So as the day comes, and it is this day, it's the week after the resurrection, it's the week after Easter Sunday, 
And they are again locked in the room and Jesus appears. And at this moment, St. Thomas the Apostle, known as Thomas the Doubter, St. Thomas the Apostle sees Jesus and believes in Jesus and his resurrection and makes one of the greatest proclamations ever. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. What a powerful proclamation that was. Acknowledging Jesus for who he is. He is our Lord and he is our God. Friends in Christ, as we celebrate this beautiful day, this Divine Mercy Sunday, we reflect upon the merciful Father, the Father that loved us so much that he gave his Son, gave his Son for the life of the world. We reflect upon the perfect act of love of Jesus Christ upon the cross, going to the cross and pouring out his life for the life of the world. We are able to see mercy in that. Love and mercy are two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. So when we look at the, the cross, we see how much God loves us. We see how much the Son loves us. And we see how mercifully merciful he is. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you today at the hour of mercy, which is 3 o'clock p.m., to pray the chaplet of divine mercy, to reflect upon the mercy of our loving God. And I also invite you to go to the Knights of Columbus website. It's a beautiful website, but on the Knights of Columbus website, they have a documentary, an hour-long documentary. And we, can, we, we give an hour to Mass, we can give an hour to this documentary. And it's a documentary on divine mercy. Beautifully, beautifully done. It allows us to hear from some just impressive speakers. We hear of the lives of saints, people like Pope St. John Paul II, people like St. Faustina. But we hear about, at the heart of it, how merciful and loving our God is. You do yourself a favor to grow in the knowledge and the love and the mercy of our loving God. So as we celebrate this, this Divine Mercy Sunday, we reflect upon the beautiful words of the image of divine mercy. Jesus, I trust in you. I trust in you because you are so merciful, so merciful in your love for me.